In Assam, the flood situation remains grim. The state of northeastern India has experienced two waves of floods in the past two months, which has led to the displacement of lakhs of people and hundreds of deaths. Today, I am joined by Dr. Mirza Zulfikar Rahman, an independent researcher based in Guwahati, to discuss the issue. Dr. Mirza holds a research specialization on border studies in Northeast India and transboundary water sharing and management issues between China, India and Bangladesh. Thank you for joining us, sir. Assam has traditionally been prone to floods. Could you explain the reason for this phenomena and tell its history? Um, when we talk about Assam, uh, it is then, if, and, we, and we also talk about the history of Assam. Uh, Assam was quite a large area, as you know, historically, and from there several states came up uh, in Northeast India. Uh, we, if we talk about a larger region, uh, this larger region has always been rain abundant region and always have been prone to floods because of the geomorphology of the uh, river Brahmaputra. Um, and especially after the 1950 earthquake, uh, when the riverbed considerably went up, uh, the river became uh, less, uh, you know, uh, able to carry the uh, water flow that was there in the monsoon season, and therefore used to frequently flood the uh, the banks. So, in that course of that, uh, immediately after the 1950 earthquake there was the need for building a lot of uh, embankments along the river uh, Brahmaputra in order to protect important oil towns and uh, tea garden growing towns uh, and other commercial establishments um, in and around major towns of Assam. And, and, and those um, embankments that were built over time and across these decades, uh, the several decades, have also quite a lot in terms of amplified, amplified the flood uh, uh, in many ways. Uh, uh, and that in combination with climate change events with different varying rainfall patterns across uh, time, in, especially in the past few years that we have seen, in combination with the infrastructure that we have laid on the ground, such as embankments, uh, has actually created the uh, floods uh, in Assam. So in that sense, uh, flood, has traditionally been welcomed by the people when these embankments were not there, when people used to dance bihu when floods used to arrive, because floods used to mean that the fertile um, silt would actually come and be deposited on the lands, where, which will actually enable to have then, then have a, a good harvest. Uh, but after a point of time, when these embankments started building on a, uh, in a different manner, because after 1950 earthquake, it was India was just getting independent and there was not enough time and resources to devote to studying the mapping the floodplain properly. And without doing that properly, there was a lot of embankments which were laid out in order to protect for short term measures. And that actually uh, over and over the decades have been layered up to such an extent that now we are seeing such a high intensity of floods um, uh, in, in the region. Yeah. While the years between 2016 and 2020 have all been flood filled, except for 2018, what went wrong on the policy level in all these years that caused people to suffer so much? So uh, the conversation around floods in Assam particularly has always been revolved around uh, the flood season first and also the, um, the attitude of only providing uh, uh, rescue and relief. You know, uh, and that has been the dominant narrative and building embankments. Whenever there is a flood prone area, you build the embankment. So um, these are very structural measures, uh, uh, you know, uh, physical infrastructure that is built by the government uh, and are very, very structural measures. And there has been traditionally uh, uh, over investment uh, by the government on structural measures to mitigate floods. Uh, uh, and that also needs to be uh, accompanied by non-structural measures, which uh, relate to more uh, other non-structural flood mitigation, um, uh, you know, uh, techniques, uh, and also uh, a consultation and a conversation with the communities who live along the river, uh, and to be able to tap into the traditional knowledge systems uh, where communities have been living with floods for generations, you know, uh, and. Uh, the inability to do that at the policy level has also uh, accentuated 
the the, the flood um, uh, the impact of the floods in recent years and and also uh, given the fact that climate change events uh, the rainfall patterns have been uh, quite uh, accumulated within a short period of time uh, and in addition to the infrastructure laid on the ground is actually creating much more destruction on the ground we had this uh, we can see this coming uh, and oh, year on year the intensity of the floods have been increasing but the point is to actually take a step back not only concentrate on only providing relief and rescue but also try to actually bring out uh, alternative non structural flood mitigation measures which are not only limited to assam but on a transboundary level you know the the solution for floods uh, again uh, um, cannot be found overnight just as the uh, reasons for the floods have not been created overnight it has taken decades to for the reason of this floods to be more intense therefore the solution for the floods also uh, will also take many more, much more time it will ne never happen overnight but the conversation has to start the conversation to my mind has not started as yet you know we have to also see how different regions around the world have coped with such kind of floods especially in the mekong delta um, and also maybe in bangladesh for example uh, in downstream uh, of the river uh, and also share best practices of mitigation measures and so that we can actually be able to uh, uh, come up to terms in the next uh, cycle of floods and the conversation around floods does not only have to happen during the flood season it has to be a year long conversation in the non flood season also we have to speak continuously speak about uh, how to actually tackle the next floods you know that has to be there that attitude has to be there exactly in this context only assam is a border state how does this factor come into play when we talk about floods in the state see coming back to the point that i made earlier that we should not see the floods uh, as contained within the uh, territory of assam only uh, assam is just one state of northeast india and there are so many linked uh, kind of factors uh, across northeast india and uh, not only northeast india but also bhutan china and bangladesh all of this cumulatively um, uh, form the crux of the larger bio region you know if you look at the geographical larger geographical region um, that uh, kind of lens should be applied in order to find mitigations and solutions to floods uh, we cannot uh, have this narrow minded view of of only assam uh, to be uh, seen because a lot of the solutions that needs to be applied in order to tackle floods and uh, has to be given at the river basin level and and not uh, at the territorial level of provinces within the indian basin state uh, bhutan has to be brought into the focus uh, china has to be brought into what is happening in china that also has to be factored in and what is also happening in downstream bangladesh how uh, how are measures taken in uh, india are affecting uh, downstream in bangladesh all of this a cooperative kind of a regional approach uh, a cooperative regional approach is the way forward uh, in order to uh, find lasting solutions towards flood because climate risk and climate change all of this and uh, huge um, calamitous events such as floods uh, are going to be the norm in the future and if we do not have a regional approach a regional solidarity we will not be able to find solutions to this correct correct keeping the rapid climate change in mind what are the three long term decisions you think the state government and other stakeholders must make as soon as possible to prevent this crisis from happening repeatedly yeah so the first uh, is that the realization that this, these solutions uh, would need to be balanced uh, between structural and non structural measures um uh, and uh, bring that effectively into policy uh, and also provide effective on ground training to a lot of the of officials and administration which is uh, involved in such flood mitigation measures uh, as of now most of the measures are mostly targeted at relief and rescue uh, uh, and which needs to be broadened uh, and for that to happen we need a lot of training uh, to be imparted uh, to district administration and also across sharing of uh, best practices even within the region for example what recently happened in selchur how the district administration were able to unable to provide um, proper uh, you know a response to that floods 
uh, has to be a lesson uh, and shared with different district administrations in within Assam and also with other states of Northeast India. Um, and also, for example, what happened in Haflong last month. Uh, so in that sense, a lot of this uh, cumulative understanding um, would then bring about uh, some sort of a change in you know, uh, attitudes towards how we actually can confront floods. Uh, and also we need to um, um, kind of bring in at a policy level uh, that um, a lot of infrastructural changes that we have seen in the past few uh, years uh, uh, has also led to a several landslides, the intensity of landslides happening in Northeast India uh, quite often. And that uh, in accompanied by floods can be very destructive to communities. So uh, that that needs to be factored in and also seeing, seeing that uh, the economic connectivity that we are trying to push through at a rapid pace should not disrupt the ecological connectivity of the region. Because if that ecological connectivity is disrupted at this pace, then the economic connectivity will also get affected at some point of time. And we can see the economic loss because of this floods every year has been quite huge. You know, um, it is not just enough to only rebuild, but also it is important to reassess and then build sustainability. That is important. And at the end, I would like to mention there is the traditional knowledge systems of communities. Is for example, I will give you the example of Haflong. Uh, last month, when the very calamitous flood actually occurred in Haflong, um, it is seen that you know a lot of um, the aspects that were done on the ground were not consulted properly with the communities. So in that sense, we need to uh, we need modern science to actually engage with traditional worldviews and uh, alternative community knowledge systems in order to be able to um, bring together uh, the best of both to be able to mitigate floods, to be able to go forward, to be able to see that how we can actually tackle this in the coming years. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for joining, Dr. Mirja. If you like our work, please subscribe to newsclick.in for more. Thanks for watching.